Um, this workshop was supposed to be on uh, augmenting mobile devices uh, towards making uh, musical instruments. So start from a mobile device and 3D print something around the mobile device. Uh, the only problem we had is that the 3D printers that we were supposed to bring didn't really make it through the Atlantic uh, option with us. So, uh, so, uh, so instead, well, we, we had to rethink about a little bit the, the general organization of the workshop. So during the first hour of the workshop, John will basically talk about 3D printing in general, and uh, I'll kind of show you the framework, which is an open source framework that uh, we were supposed to use during the workshop to make 3D printed elements. And then during the last two hours of the workshop, uh, we'll do some mobile development using the Faust programming language uh, to turn your smartphone into uh, sound toys or musical musical instruments. So, uh, in case you think you will be around when this happens, uh, if you make it that, that far in the workshop, uh, in preparation for that, we kind of would like you to uh, pre-install some of the, the Android development toolkit on your um, uh, computer, which uh, is fine, you know, because since the, during the first hour you're not going to need that, you can actually do it during the first hour, uh, and it should not take more than uh, this. If you want to do this, uh, then uh, you should uh, go uh, uh, this, uh, uh, do you have a web browser somewhere? Right here. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, but it's not. Uh... So maybe uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe you can explain maybe you, because I don't understand why we have to um, print something to make uh, an augmented uh, reality with my. Smartphone. Oh, it's not augmented reality. It, it, it's it's oh. set. It has. Uh, it's more of an ergonomic. Uh, Absolutely. So. Uh, has to do with so the... I can yeah. give you an example. Yeah. So. Here is an example of a very stupid sound toy that you can make in the frame of this workshop. So this thing here was uh, 3D printed, and it's this uh, prosthetic that you can just uh, plug to uh, your device, you know, and now you can play it and just do. Yeah. So uh, so that's like one thing that you can make, you know. But uh, but then there are other things that you could do, you know. And so it's just that basically John will talk about all these things during the first hour of the workshop, you know, like the whole concept behind uh, that types of things. Uh, so just that I'm kind of uh, going ahead a little bit, you know, just to warn you uh, to some extent that uh, we're like. Because that's what we talked about in the description of the workshop, and unfortunately, because we don't have the printers with us, yeah. we're sort of uh, limited. You know what? So, so during the during the first hour, John will talk about uh, 3D printing in general, uh, applied to acoustics and also to mobile phone augmentations. And then during the rest of the workshop, uh, we'll just uh, make apps like this one here uh, that can, you know, be sound toys, but they can also be things that are more like uh, actual musical instruments or or whatever. You know, so uh, so that that's kind of the the whole framework for for this thing. I hope that helps. I know it's not super clear, like when you uh, when you read like uh, the description, you're like, what the what the fuck is this about? You know, but. Uh, but uh, <laughs> That's true. I think it's a fair question, but uh, but anyhow, so if you uh, if you want to uh, get started, and uh, everyone has the internet here, right? Uh, well, if you don't, uh, you should be able to to get it anyway, right? But uh, but so uh, if you go at this URL here, so karma.stanford.edu. Uh, and then uh, tilde r mention slash, uh, well actually if you just go there, and then uh, if you go uh, in fast tutorials, I'll just show the, the URL, I think that's probably the easiest way of doing that, and then making fast based for musical instruments, uh, getting ready to demo the app, so yeah. So, if you follow those instructions here, so the instructions that you have, so here at this URL, so uh, fast tutorials, uh, 
Sharp, getting ready to develop apps, okay? Uh, you basically want to install Faust and you want to install Android Studio. Uh, everyone has an Android phone here, right? Who doesn't have an Android phone? You don't have, what, what do you have, Windows phone? You don't have phone. It's the previous Nokia. Yeah, but we. Yeah. No, it's Jola. I think I can. Ah, Jola, Jola. Jola. I see. Wow, that's a. Uh, we never had that before. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what about you? What do you do with that? Interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, wow. it's uh, <laughs> That's crazy. That's so, I think great. you're really going to come to. Oh. Uh, this one. <laughs> 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 I love it. Ben, you're really going to come to Linux Audio Conference to be confronted to that, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I taught this workshops already a few times, you know, like, uh, not the one about 3D printing, but the one about uh, making smartphones, you know, and, uh, and you know, like, uh, like the, the, the worst case scenario, there is, like, one guy out of 20 who has a Windows phone, you know, like, and, uh, but you guys are, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to ruin our stats, that's, uh, <laughs> Holy shit, well, that's, uh, <laughs> well, that kind of solves, uh, that kind of solves, uh, all our problems. Well, maybe, you know what, John, I, I don't know what you think, you know, but, uh, but since, because, yes? Jola and uh, Blackberry have an Android emulator. A what? An Android emulator. emulator. Ah, I see. So and maybe, and yeah, and but, and I just feel like, but I will, I can write here about the in the first. Sure, very good. So you know what? I think uh, let's actually let's do that because uh, I think uh, maybe John, you yeah. could just give your lecture. <laughs> sure. Do what you were supposed to do, and, uh, and I think plus you know it's right afternoon. Uh, it's uh, it's the end of uh, it's the end of black. Uh, we're uh, sort of thirsty as well. You know, like, so maybe let's have fun. Let's. Uh, I, I think. Let's just do that, you know, and, um, and maybe let's forget about the, the, the other part then. Because uh, I feel like it's going to be too complicated uh, if no one has a device which is going to work with that, you know, like, so, uh, right. so I'm, uh, I'm really sorry, but uh, yeah, we, we limited that to iOS and Android, you know, and, uh, and uh, I feel like even with an emulator, I feel like it's going to be complicated, just installing the app from Android Studio might be, no, might... Just add to, to download the APK. And yeah. And it works. Okay. Well, John, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the, the easiest way. And then we'll we'll see what our we'll see sure. What our, yeah. Um, yeah. My name is John Granzo. I worked with Roma Michel at Stanford in California. Now I'm in Ann Arbor in Michigan. Um, so uh, a little bit of a, a jaunt to the Great Lakes region. Uh, where in the Performing Arts Technology Department we've uh, been developing our uh, digital fabrication shop. Um, and uh, my research uh, and teaching is, um, uh, has a lot to do with uh, building musical instruments, uh, integrating electronics for uh, synthesis, and also thinking about ergonomics and how uh, digital fabrication uh, is a game changer in terms of uh, what we can make, uh, how we can uh, replicate existing things, things that maybe are irreplaceable from a museum, how we can augment existing things, and how we can prototype new inventions. Uh, it's sort of a, I think the, 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 one of the game changers is that things are now on our desktop. We have this long history of, of knowledge that once tools get on our desktop, uh, really creative things happen. So now these uh, additive and subtractive machines are, um, can just exist on our desk and somewhat safely operate. So this is a 3D printer in our shop printing a uh, tenor saxophone mouthpiece and a CNC machine subtractively carving out uh, a model of a pin -in. And all, all run serially from the same laptop. So it's becoming this world where you can both subtractively and additively uh, create these 3D models uh, directly from your CAD models and the software is, is all free. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the experience this year with my, my class, just to show you what's happening in the educational realm in my world. Uh, we did a class called Digital Fabrication for Acoustics, where students 
uh, built um, musical instruments of various kinds or did research projects. This is some acoustic chambers for a Comanche, an Iranian stringed instrument. Um, I also bar, uh, one of my students built this. So these are laser cut um, rings that uh, are superposed to create this chamber. And uh, the, the thing that kind of changes the game is how quickly this can be mocked up and prototyped. And uh, a 3D printed bridge. And within um, a one month project, he had a functioning uh, amplified Camache. That, that, uh, uh, yeah. Question: What what do you use for CAD software in those classes? Is it uh, Open SCAD? You use Open SCAD. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to look at Open SCAD, which is what it, the the library that we are showing in this workshop is is in. Uh, the other project we did uh, just to reveal um, some of the interesting ways that we can integrate digital fabrication into organology is we invaded the Stern's instrument collection, a huge warehouse of old instruments, and the students basically repaired instruments by replicating components and uh, modeling them from this being an old strobe violin. They also practiced their CAD work, uh, just replicating instruments they f that they found in the collection. <coughs> And as an example of one of the research projects, um, there's a, a, a lot of work on haptics in our department. So the idea of materializing data, we often hear of sonifying data, materializing data so that you get a tactile experience. So uh, Spencer Haney, one of my students, um, put a slide pot underneath a printed spectrogram. And so you can actually feel the, uh, the excursions of the, the spectrogram and also hear um, the, the frequency bands. And so this is a, a basically um, an analysis of a recording of a bell. So he's now doing an independent study with a, a visually uh, impaired researcher who's interested in tactile ways of understanding and learning about um, uh, audio data. So uh, these printers are fairly limited still in their, their uh, volume that we can print. How do we ramp this up? This is in the architecture building where the automotive industry donates robots uh, to the school. And you can quickly put a, a, a nice sized extruder on these robots and have much larger capacity to print uh, potentially larger instruments. Uh, at the moment, though, uh, our limitations really is, uh, really is to make smaller projects, components, augment phones, for example, is the perfect form factor for the printers that we usually use. I heard you can get those for very little money now. Like These robots? Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, the, the, um, uh, um, the, the position of the University of Michigan is you know, adjacent to the uh, American Automotive Center. And when these robots are no longer used, they, they almost give them away to the school. So uh, I, I think of uh, 3D printing as having these sort of three usage categories that basically any tool might have when you first start using it. You first see if it can make what is already made with replication. Um, then you realize that you can also augment. You can think of 3D printing as a sophisticated adhesive. You can augment found objects or, in this case, uh, our devices that are in our pockets. And then this more fantastical uh, invention where you might actually try to invent a completely new instrument. Uh, this is Avit Zoran's nested trumpet. Um, uh, the uh, 3D printed acoustic guitar that made a lot of splash. It's, it's sort of these projects that make a lot of media splash because they have kind of a built-in evaluation where we, we know what they should sound like. And so we say, yes, that kind of sounds like a violin, uh, but obviously not, not quite up to the standards of a, a seasoned instrument. So I, I'm, I'm not overly interested in replicating instruments with a lot of <coughs> history and knowledge because, uh, in, in fact, this was probably a $3,000 print, and, uh, and it, was, it sounded like a $100 guitar. Uh, the other problem is you ignore some of the material correlates. So the, the bracing of a guitar is, is very um, tailored to what the grains of the wood. And when you strictly replicate your dreadnought, you ignore those material uh, features. Where, where replication is interesting is 
when uh, we can uh, manufacture locally things that otherwise would have made an object obsolete. So this is a, basically about that big. It's a tiny spring used in the um, uh, action of a harpsichord. Uh, these harpsichords are common um, around the world and the manufacturer injection molded this spring and it's no longer made. So they're becoming very, very expensive Clearly someone, the market might, def might condition this so that someone actually starts manufacturing them again. But in the meantime, there's harpsichords out there that don't work anymore simply because they're missing this tiny little spring. So this is a project uh, I did with Joe Gasho, the harpsichordist, where we um, used a Formlabs printer, which is the first desktop SLS printer, um, to make these high resolution springs. So this is not part of the model. This is just support material that gets removed after, and the spring exists inside the action of the harpsichord. Uh, so that... Sorry, yeah. but what you call spring, but for me it's a, a season, I don't understand. Oh, spring. A uh, spring, uh, en français, c'est comment? Un ressort. Un ressort. Ah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, this, it doesn't look like a, a spring, uh, but it has, a, it has a restoring force just in the plastic, and, and these old, very valuable instruments not, not that old relative to some instruments, but uh, 19th century instruments use this tiny plastic spring um, that uh, is not made anymore. So th this is the first prototype, and this is one of the uh, few remaining ones that uh, Joe Gasho had. Um, so replication can be interesting in that sense of avoiding obsolescence. It's also interesting to replicate instruments that otherwise were very hard to uh, access. So. Uh, the acoustician Tom Rossing once said that the vocal tract is like the violin in its case, studying the violin left in its case. It's sometimes very hard to image the uh, posture of the vocal tract. Um, and the vocal tract uh, obviously is the, um, the uh, uh, physiological um, yeah. com component of the, uh, of, the, of, of the voice, but also of wind instruments. So uh, aerophones often have effects that are very correlated with vocal posture. The uh, harmonica, for example, you can't even get all the notes without a very constrained vocal posture to bend the reeds. This is bending the notes, as you've probably heard in, in uh, blues harp playing. So we did some fMRI scans of um, the vocal tract during, uh, during these bends with the harmonica. And we see a highly constrained and difficult posture. And this is why bending the notes on the harmonica is a very difficult task. And this is the uh, sagittal view of the vocal tract. And this is the uh, coronal view where you see that the soft palate aperture is very, very small. So it's very difficult to do. With these uh, uh, fMRI slices, we're able to um, use an open source software called 3D Slicer to threshold what the difference between tissue and, and the void and the cavity. And this software then generates a 3D model, which we can then slice. So the, uh, the, 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 the workflow is to uh, acquire the images, um, uh, create a composite from the four millimeter diameter <coughs> slices, and produce a 3D model. Of the so this is the vocal tract of a professional harmonica player bending one note on the instrument. And so uh, this is a rather novel thing that 3D printing allows us to do, is to actually empirically test some of these imaging uh, techniques. So we then create a, um, a model for silicone. We're going to create a positive of the vocal tract uh, performing that uh, technique. And, and then make a negative in also a 3D printed mold. And we have these rather sculptural um, physiological correlates with different uh, musical techniques. So this is a, a B4 bent down on the harmonica to an A, and a, a half step bend, a B4 down one semitone to B flat. So is it a uh, vocal chord? One? Uh, this is the vocal track. The vocal cords are down here. Yeah, so this is a, a, an acoustic chamber associated with a musical technique. Uh, for one note bent down, you know the harmonica when you... Uh, okay. Uh, I'm singer, so 
Okay, yeah, well, well you can do this with... Yeah, um, the harmonica is, is missing certain notes. You have to do a vocal technique to pull the note down to, to complete even the, uh, well, complete the chromatic scale. So the instrument is incomplete without these techniques. Um, and it's a, a very novel thing that we can do is produce these prosthetics and we draw low pressure through them with the instrument and they reproduce the, they reproduce the techniques uh, as a prosthetic. Um, so it's a way to study musical techniques uh, using digital fabrication. Uh, any questions? Uh, the other interesting thing with replication is how it leads to invention. So in graphic um, CAD software, we can quickly model from dimensions we find online. We can quickly model a mouthpiece that works very well uh, with a high resolution print. And with simple, um, simple features or affordances of the CAD program, we can do things like uh, loft these forms and mirror them. If you do this, you immediately have an idea uh, what does a double reeded uh, tenor saxophone mouthpiece look like, or does it even function? And then you do some uh, research and you find out that uh, an organologist and instrument builder named Josef Schunda, inventor of the modern terragata, um, once tried a double reeded uh, terragata mouthpiece that shared the chamber and, it, and, he, and he decided that it didn't work, that there was nothing interesting about it. So it exists in a musical instrument museum. Uh, nonetheless, we proceeded to uh, create a double reeded tenor saxophone mouthpiece with, um, with individual chambers for each reed. Um, as an experimental mouthpiece, you can see the chambers have to now um, uh, be rotated to uh, couple to their individual columns. And so this is a an ability to take a known musical object and quickly transform it into something very experimental. That would be interesting to someone like Rassen Roland Kirk, who is known for playing multiple multiple horns at the same time. Well, I think he, he may, if he was still alive, may have been interested in this mouthpiece. You can get very interesting beating between, between the reeds. Uh, so this is still in the usage category of replication. But it just shows you how uh, the, the, the workflow of drawing these things quickly leads to uh, inventive ideas and productions. Um, we're, we even, we're 3D printing reeds, which uh, do not work as well as uh, cane reeds, of course, but they, they work. And uh, I suppose the trade-off is that you can do something like this, introduce a negative cavity into your reed where a microphone can be placed in the middle of a print. So this is a piezo contact microphone um, that is placed into the 3D print um, as it's printing. I've got a... Francois making duck. Yeah. My mom's promised me that for years. <laughs> and this is the uh, outcome, is you have basically a, a, a way of interacting with these entry-level machines, you can place electronics inside. Uh, there's now more sophisticated robots that pick and place uh, mid-print, so that's sort of what we're looking forward to. But with the affordable printers, you can do things like this. Uh, and that gives you a way to pick up the, the oscillation of the reed without the feedback of the air chamber if you want to just process that part of the instrument. Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, where replication gets interesting. Not I'm going to print a whole dreadnought guitar and see if it sounds like a guitar, but uh, I'm going to print a reed and see what the machine affordance uh, leads to uh, no uh, novel kinds of applications. Augmentation uh, is where we're sort of at with this workshop. And I think of it as um, uh, potentially uh, more like an orthotic than a prosthetic. Um, 3D printing has uh, received a lot of press for prosthetics, that is actual uh, physiological prosthetics for the body. It's been very useful to customize um, prosthetics for children in countries where they maybe couldn't uh, previously afford to make a prosthetic that, would, that the child would grow out of in, in a week or a month. 
Well, an orthotic, however, is more like an augmentation. It, it exists outside of the body in, in physiological terms, to, for example, to augment the, the spine, um, or in this case, to augment a phone, or to take a found object and transform its function. So how is this applied to the affordances of our devices for me? <coughs> I think of this as the interop interoperability of things. We're used to hearing about the interoperability of, uh, of platforms, computer platforms. Um, this is Golan Levin's Universal Connector Kit. So it's a kit that you can download for free and 3D print to connect your Lego to your Tinker Toys, uh, to every kind of connector kit you have can now be connected. So this is a sort of a beautiful thing about these machines. The other thing I love about augmentation is to take a, 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 a modern interaction that is supposed to be an improvement and, and restore the, the old, really good one that actually worked. To turn the things on and off. So someone 3D printed a, a switch uh, to, to restore. Because we all know that feeling of not existing. Yeah. Um, we're setting up a, a listening room at Michigan with, uh, with Genelec speakers. Genelec speakers have this um, really frust well, they're, they're great speakers, but they have this frustrating curvilinear contour, and there's no, there's no right angles. So if you want to build a structure for the speaker to, to hold the laser, to build an ambisonic system to point the speakers into the middle of the room, it's very hard. But if you can find drawings like this online, you don't even need CAD models, you have the contour, and you can scale it up to make a 3D model of a hat that will go on the speaker perfectly and sit right in the center of, of the, um, the speaker for this application. So this is my uh, a student, Max, who made this hat, and it's uh, a, a wonderful example of uh, using 3D printing to kind of augment or, um, or uh, adapt a, a physical object in the world. So. Um, Rather than accepting uh, the inventory of made things, we can now use 3D printing as a kind of adhesive to change their, their functions. We can also come up with open source uh, um, uh, microphones that are much cheaper than the ones. This is a 32 channel microphone I, I made uh, at Karma. Um, and and I, I think of this as adaptation or augmentation as well because we look at the existing components the microphone capsules that are available, the electronics that are available out there for low cost, and we actually adapt the enclosure to what we can buy for, for very low cost. Uh, you may know that these microphones commercially purchased are, are tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and with CAD, we can um, adapt parametrically the perforations to the microphone capsules. We can decide, given the uh, the uh, polygon side count, we can decide what uh, ambisonic order, um, what order of microphone it is, and uh, we can use readily available plumbing from the hardware store to create a very rigid uh, uh, enclosure, and these are custom printed uh, PCB boards that are the preamps for the microphones. It was a terrible mess, but it ended up working with very little crosstalk. So that, that is also a case of replication, because these microphones already exist. But with, um, with, custom, um, with uh, the ability to customize the geometry, we can imagine now having all kinds of different shaped spherical microphones. So if we move from a spherical case to a lenticular case where it was smushed, we have an interesting possibility of having a higher density of microphones where, where they actually make more, uh, more of a difference on the, on the azimuth. So uh, this transformation from uh, dodecahedral 32-channel microphone to a tetramic uh, is, is, is uh, one variable change in the polygon count. So we go from that to uh, an open source uh, tetramic for ambisonics that uh, Fernando Lopez Lascano has now taken off with, uh, with his uh, Tetramic, which is all open source and uses OpenSCAD as well, the library. Um, so 3D printing comes in handy uh, simply to attach things. I think of it as an advanced adhesive. This is an installation uh, recently did in, in Ann Arbor called String Section. 
Uh, it's a feedback system. These speakers are hung from piano wire, and the piano wire is, uh, the, the vibrations are harvested through these metal soundboards and fed back through the speakers. So each speaker is a modular feedback system that, uh, that basically talks to the uh, variable distances from the speaker to the, to the first soundboard. Um, so, how do you connect a contact microphone to a suspended system like this without it peeling off or breaking or being subject to uh, abuse by uh, participants? Um, it's hard to see it here, but there's a, in the same way that the piezo microphone was printed into the reed, it's printed into a disc that has features to attach um, rigidly. So you can see it there. It's, it's, uh, I didn't get great documentation of it. But on the bottom there is a 3D printed um, cake in which the microphone is embedded. And it's very sturdy, so it, it lasted the full uh, month of the installation. So there it is there. Uh, and this, this I think of as uh, augmenting objects in an installation or customizing them. A part of this project was glass blowing. We did some glass blowing. We made these uh, Peruvian whistling vessels. So this is a, an instrument where the glass vessel is acting only as a pump. So the air draws in and out of the two chambers and um, the, the glass from the glass blowing has certain kinds of um, perforations in it and we, we measure that, we 3D scan it and we 3D print whistles that fit right into the glass. So this ability to, um, I've actually never seen a glass whistling vessel before and maybe for this reason is that ceramic whistling vessels have the whistle sculpted and this is actually, uh, you can actually now customize your, uh, your resonate, your, uh, your, your uh, excitation point, in this case an edge uh, whistle, to the, um, to the object. This was also done with gas tanks, which have the same shape. So these are motorcycle gas tanks, flipped upside down. And these are 3D printed whistles uh, uh, that are customized to their shape. So, the water, this is strictly acoustic, driven by uh, car, uh, motors that, um, that uh, move car windows up in the car window motors. It's actually an old video because the barbecue is still there. Yeah, so it's strictly acoustic. Uh, as you can tell, that you can actually change the airflow with that preparation. Um, the, uh, the ability to take an object that you find in the junkyard that uh, has been discarded and think of it as an instrument and quickly go model the features that would turn it into a, a, a musical instrument. Does everyone recognize this object? Yeah, from, a, from an espresso maker, um, uh, juxtaposed with a banjo out of scale. And that's the way I saw it in the junkyard and quickly uh, 3D printed features to turn it into a small uh, ukulele or javelele, as I like to call it. And so th these can be quickly customized to a found object and transform its functionality um, and also quickly um, model the, the fret dif differences based on the exponential equation for the division of the string, um, customize the features for the back of the espresso uh, portafilter handle, and create fixed string features so it stays on. Uh, we, in the first um, talk of the conference, we heard a lot about a very sophisticated way of hot swapping um, interfaces. Well, if, if your only concern is that the uh, cable will pull out, this was for the laptop orchestra, you can also do something like this where you customize a bracket for the, uh, for the laptop. So that your uh, this is an obviously an <coughs> old image because that, I think that's firewire still, but it doesn't pull out. So that that when, when we started doing this many years ago, it became obvious that one of the one of the one of the ways in which we are still very constrained is with the uh, ergonomics or the form of these devices. And if 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 they are great opportunities for instruments because of their processing power, um, we they are nonetheless not designed to be interacted with in a, in a, in a compelling way, necessarily. So um, we started to augment uh, the mobile phone. Uh, this has been done in many other contexts. This is a 3D printed phone uh, holder for a car. Uh, lots of applications online where you can download 
cases to hold a GoPro, but what about the, the musical side? What does that mean? And that's what this workshop is, is about. So um, I'm going to show you a few slides from uh, Romain's recent talk at 9, where we start to ask, what can, you, what can you do with the phone quickly with digital fabrication to change the way you can interact with it? And so this, this part of the workshop is very much related to the application that you might build. So you build them in tandem. You might build an application where you're using the accelerometer in a way where you, you don't want to have to grip the phone. You want to be able to hold it just with your thumb through a ring so you can freely tap the screen. Well, you can't freely tap the screen when you're holding your phone because you actually have to hold it with your thumb. So that, that's actually one of the things I, uh, if, if we have the, the energy and time to do today, we can try to model a little ring for the, for the phone. Um, so uh, these are some of the projects from the uh, workshop uh, last year. And one of them indeed is that very uh, realization that with, a, with a, a snug press fit ring over your thumb, you have a much more free interaction with the, the application that the So OpenSCAD is the, the modeling environment that uh, we've been using. It's, uh, for those who are used to uh, graphic CAD modeling, it seems somewhat daunting to, to uh, write code for, for CAD, but actually it's very intuitive and it's, it's actually a very fun way to create uh, models. It's also very good for parametric modeling. Uh, so, um, CAD. Maybe say what CAD is, right? Because I feel like oh, CAD. Uh, well, it's CAD in English stands for Computer Assisted Design or Computer Assisted Drawing. So um, this is uh, any kind of software that allows you to build three-dimensional meshes 
And these are the uh, models that you then export as STLs. Uh, STL um, originally stood for a standard tessellated language. Now people think of it as uh, stereolithography. STL is basically the MP3 of things, and there's a lot of work now to improve that file format. But it's basically the file format that 3D printers understand. So you can export um, your, uh, your OpenSCAD model as an STL, and uh, if, if everything goes well, your, 3D, your, your slicing software will be able to slice that into layers that then can be uh, printed sequentially and additively to produce your object. This is the, the first example in OpenSCAD um, uh, that you will find if you download it um, um, is, is simply showing you the basic booleans um, of a union, of a cube and a sphere. So we have the union, the intersection, where you have the, uh, the, the uh, part that they share disappears with the intersection, and with difference, which is the one uh, that actually is probably most useful, is simply to subtract the second object sphere from the first. So we, in OpenSCAD, you have these high-level primitives that you can use to create uh, basic objects like this. So um, that's the first example. The documentation is really good. And uh, in terms of uh, what we were intending to print, if the printers had arrived, was something you could, you could uh, bravely glue onto your uh, phone case to provide this, this ring that would allow you to, to tap your application without also having to hold it. Um, so if we just look at uh, an example of that, here's one way to do it. Um, so the, the interface is a preview of your model here. That is actually not your, the mesh that you can export. If you actually want to render the mesh, you do it with this icon here. And uh, OpenSCAD has its own STL export icon because so many people use it for uh, 3D printing. So this might be a ring that you could make that would glue onto your phone case that would allow you to interact freely with your fingers on the screen. And what we have here is not much different than the, the first example, a set of nested differences. And if we look at the, 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 the core difference here is between a polygon, which is this triangle that has been extruded, so it's a linear extrude of a polygon, and a cube. So the cube is rotated and translated so that it uh, gives us that angle. If you want to see the subtracted um, geometries, you can put the pound sign in front and you see that that cube is there <laughs> but it's just being used as a subtraction of, of that feature. So uh, this is one way to draw, if you, if you don't have the primitive available, you can also just draw a polygon. And if you don't uh, define the path, the polygon will just draw the most obvious path and create a surface. So these are the x, y uh, uh, points, three points on the x, y plane to create a polygon. The reason why it's three-dimensional is because before there's a linear extrude with a height um, uh, 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 specification that it's centered in the interface and how many slices. So um, uh, then there's uh, other nested differences to get these other features. It's actually probably not the, the easiest way to do it. Uh, for example, instead of this pyramid shape for the stand, you could easily make this uh, a conical shape. And the conical shape could be done with a primitive. Um, uh, for example, if we look at this, this is how easy a cone is, is you have the primitive of a cylinder. If we get rid of the second radius, um, we have a very uh, thin uh, cylinder. Uh, actually, the, it knows that it's a cylinder because they only gave it one radius. We can give it a height of 100, um, and we see that it's this very low resolution cylinder. Um, 
if we want to make this cylinder a higher resolution, we uh, use the fn command for how many sides we want it to have. And now it's looking more like a 100-sided cylinder. Interestingly enough, if you want to uh, make it a, a triangle, you, of course, just make three, and you have a triangle. Um, and if we want to make a cone as a base for that ring, we can just define two radii. Um, R1. <coughs> And this should give us a cone. So this could be used to make a base for our ring if, we're, if we were gluing it onto the, the phone case. And, and your application might ask you to do that. So it's this interesting feedback between what, what kind of instrument are you designing as an application, what kind of buttons and sliders are you integrating, and therefore how do you want to hold the phone? Do you want to, do you want to roll it like a musical toy? Do you want to hold it and perform with it more like an instrument? Um, so that, that would be an easier way to do the stand. Um, the, uh, the ring, of course, you can already guess is a simple difference, right? So you can, you can imagine uh, just a difference between two cylinders. The second one will be subtracted from the first. So I don't know, at this point in the workshop, we wanted you guys to try this. Uh, I don't know if anyone uses OpenSCAD, but try to make uh, your own ring for your, for your phone. Uh, is that a... You know, my, I feel like maybe we should just move on, you know, like to, uh, to the other stuff, you know, yeah. uh, and give people, like, all the, the material, potentially, okay. you know. And, uh, should I just briefly show the, the yeah. library? Uh, yeah, so yeah. The, the library is, uh, of course, um, a way to uh, ramp this up to phones that you might have, uh, no one here has apparently, well maybe they do now, others have shown up. We have this wonderful moment where, what were the, <laughs> um, so if you, if you look at uh, the basic, um, idea of, a, of one of the high level cases is you call from the library, the iPhone 6.scad um, example, and you, uh, you basically put the phone inside of, these, uh, inside of the, the parameters of, of the library. So this allows you to actually see a model of the phone inside of, um, of a given uh, instrument. So uh, this produces the model of the rock uh, iPhone 6 around that model of the phone. And there's an instrument associated with this, an application you can, you can compile on your phone. So the, the library um, is, is not complete, obviously, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of phones missing, but we, there's uh, iPads, uh, iPhone 5, 6, and um, if you uh, want to develop further, it's, it's available on GitHub, right, Roma? Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so if we look at the library itself, that's where all the features of each phone are are presented, so the iPhone 6 Plus, um, <clears throat> all of its dimensions and possible augmentations are here. So all of the dimensions are here that you can call and add all the things that we've so far invented for the workshop. Yeah, every, everything is very parametric, you know, like, so, uh, you know, one of the main challenge with mobile devices is that they all have different sizes and shapes and whatever, like, speaker might be on one side or maybe on another side, you know, and, and so, uh, so all these versions of the library are very similar except for the global variables that are declared at the beginning of the library, which kind of allow you to customize it for uh, the phone that you have, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so that's it's kind of the cool thing about using uh, CAD software, which is ba based on a on a, uh, a programming language, you know, which uh, you would not really uh, be able to get if you were using uh, SolidWorks or uh, any graphical CAD software, basically. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So should we move on to the? Yeah, maybe yeah, I can. Uh, sure. I can. Uh, so, so I have one question. Yes. Is the SCAD a proprietary um, no. extent? No, it's no. 
Um, it, it works on, on, on all operating systems. Yeah, it works on Windows, Linux, and on, on the Mac, and it's open source. So, uh, so it's uh, it, there are multiple CAD softwares that are open source or free. Uh, this one is kind of the only one which is uh, completely just based on a programming language, uh, which is a very high level programming language. And uh, there are other one, you know, like uh, uh, the one developed by Google. I forgot its name. What? What is it, John? Uh, uh, SketchUp. Yeah, SketchUp. That are free, but that are not open source. You know, so uh, but. Uh, but this one is kind of nice because it has a very different paradigm than most CAD software. Like normally when you do CAD design, what you do is you start from a 2D shape, so like a 2D drawing, and then you extrude it. So uh, you start from 2D and then you go to 3D from 2D. Uh, well, with OpenSCAD, you can do that, uh, but you can also start from 3D and expand to different shapes uh, starting from 3D. So the the, the, the paradigm uh, to approach the, the, the design of your parts is very different, and, um, and uh, I kind of I kind of like it. So yeah. And the, the parametric affordance <coughs> is, is unrivaled, really. If you try to do um, something like this in, in a graphic program like Rhino, you, you could, of course, but it would it would be a lot more code than this because you can just you can just uh, subject one geometry to a for loop. That is continuously translated and rotated to, to create a, a tree. So um, it's it's very powerful for parametric things. So so say you made your ring and you weren't sure it was the right size, you could quickly make a, an array of them with incrementally increasing sizes and then print them all out and one of them would fit. So it's very good for something like that. So uh, I think I'm gonna. So John talked about the, the hardware part of all this. Now I'm going to talk about the software part. So, uh, so once again, uh, the, the tool chain you need to have on your computer to do all these things is kind of long to set up. And, uh, and I know that most of you don't have it. You know, like, so, uh, so instead of doing kind of what we plan, I think I'm just going to give you a one hour lecture where I show you how to use it. And, uh, and then if you want to try it at home, you know, everything is online, it's all documented. And if you want to, uh, to, to play with it, you're more than welcome to, to do so and just, uh, and just uh, try it. Okay, so uh, I think I will do this. Back up over here. So John talked about hardware. I'm gonna talk about software. And uh, we've been developing uh, this tool, which is using the Faust programming language to, uh, to make uh, very easily iPhone and Android uh, apps. And this is what I'm going to show you now. I just need my phone and the cable for it. So, uh, so this works on Android. This works on iOS. If you have something else, uh, uh, unfortunately, this will not work. So it doesn't work on Windows Phone or uh, other types of operating system. But as long as you have Android or iOS, this should uh, this should work. So the idea of this framework is to uh, is to be able just to uh, to make applications for to turn your phone into a musical instrument, basically, uh, and take advantage of the sensors. Take advantage of the touch screen, you know, and um, and, uh, and some of you probably tried uh, Faust to Android or Faust to iOS, which we already had in Faust for a while. Uh, the only problem with those architectures is that they are they, they have a very standard interface, basically. You know, you have sliders, you have knobs, you have buttons, you know, and uh, and most of the time, if you want to make uh, a musical instrument, so something that you can use for a live performance. Uh, knobs and sliders and buttons are just not adapted. You know, like sometimes you want a keyboard. Sometimes you just want to have X Y controller. You know, and, and so the the framework that I'm going to present to you now uh, is here to sort of uh, bridge this uh, gap. So all you need on your computer, if you want to develop for Android, is to you need Faust and you need Android Studio, which uh, is free. I don't think it's open source, or maybe, no, actually, I think it is open source. Um, and um, you can download that from the, from the Android website, you know, and that's the only two things that you need on your computer in order to do um, all, these, uh, all these things. 
Uh, okay, so I'm trying to share my screen with you, but... Oh, no, there we go. Perfect. That works. Um, okay, very cool. So, um, so I'm just going to show you a very simple example. Uh, we're going to investigate it, you know, and, uh, and then we'll look at things that are a little bit more uh, sophisticated than, uh, than, uh, than this. So uh, let me just open this in a text uh, editor. So I'm going to open this in Atom. There we go. And uh, perfect. And uh, we're going to look at the trumpet example. Yep. So for those of you who are not familiar with Faust, I'm just going to uh, give you a quick Faust lecture here, uh, just so that you sort of know what's uh, what's happening in here. But um, so Faust is a functional programming language for real-time signal processing, and uh, it allows you basically to write uh, DSP specifications uh, using Faust, you know, and then to export that uh, to uh, other programming languages like C++. Okay, so here I'm just implementing a very basic synthesizer, which is based on a Sawtooth wave. Okay, so that's the Sawtooth wave. Maybe I can uh, increase the size further so that everyone sees what's happening. So we have a Sawtooth wave. Okay. Uh, then we have an envelope generator, okay, and the envelope generator is very basic here, because it's basically just a smoothing function, okay, so it's not really a uh, very good envelope generator, but it still works, okay. We're multiplying the Sawtooth wave by the envelope, okay, just, uh, just as we would do like in PD, you know, or SuperFighter or any other uh, program language, okay. And then we're connecting the Sawtooth wave to a low-pass filter, okay. Uh, this low-pass filter here has two parameters. The first parameter is the order of the Butterworth low-pass filter. So here it's third order. Uh, you know, if you increase the order, then the, the slope um, of the low-pass filter will increase, uh, will increase as well. Three works pretty well in that case. And the second parameter is the cutoff uh, frequency. Okay. So here we really have a very, very simple synthesizer. Like really nothing crazy, just sawtooth through low-pass filter. And then what this does at the end is that uh, we take the output of the low-pass filter and we split it into two signals, okay? Uh, because my smartphone has two speakers, okay? So, uh, so this is speaker one, this is speaker two. Uh, you don't have to do that, but if you do it, it's better because it will just be louder, right? Because uh, you have your two speakers, you want to use both of them, right? Um, okay. So what is going to happen here is that uh, I want to turn this into an app that I can use to play that. So the resulting app, uh, after this is compiled, will just look like this. I'm going to show it to you on the iPad because the screen is larger and I can't really uh, uh, display it. Um, but so what we're going to make here is we're going to make this app where we have um, this interface, which is very basic, okay, it's just uh, it's just uh, one, two, three, four, five keyboards in parallel, okay, and the keyboards are arranged in an isomorphic way, meaning that each uh, keyboard is one fourth the parts of each other, okay, uh, which is very natural for guitar players because that's kind of how guitar strings are arranged on the guitar, okay. And uh, so if we compile this, this is what we're going to get, you know, and then as far as performing it. Okay, so, uh, so that's really what we get, you know, and, uh, and so if you, if you listen to the sound that we're generating here, we have the sound with wave with a low pass filter. Okay, so how do we go from this to this? Okay, that's uh, the interesting part, and that's what we're gonna do. Uh, that's what we're gonna do here. So first, I'm just gonna briefly show you the the, the tool chain to go to compile that into the app, and then I'll I'll go a little bit further inside the code and tell you uh, what this does exactly. Okay. So the first thing you need to do once everything is installed on your computer, you need uh, your terminal, and in the terminal, you need to uh, compile this app. So this app currently. 
uh, is uh, in the Faust uh, distribution of my computer, and it's in examples, smart keyboard. Uh, there we go, and then you just have to say Faust to smart key. Okay. <coughs> Then you want to say Android, because here I'm going to compile the app for my Android device. Uh, if you wanted to make an iOS app, you would just say iOS. Okay. So here I'm just saying Android. Uh, then I just want to say that I want to generate the source code of the app. Okay. Because what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to open the app in Android Studio. Because uh, it's kind of a nice way just to export the app on the device. Okay. So I want to generate the source. And I just want to be able to reuse the source in case I'm recompiling the app. Because uh, the only problem with Android apps is that they are very, very big. There are a lot of stuff that get compiled in them. And, uh, and so most of the time I don't want to recompile the entire app. I just want to recompile the part that was changed, basically. So that's why I'm using reuse here. And then I'm just going to say trumpet.dsp. Then I press return. It's not smart keyboard, it's smart keyboard. There we go. So after that, uh, if I look at what is in my current directory, I have now a new folder which was created, which is called Faust Smart Key dot Trumpet. Okay. So once I have this, I just need to start Android Studio. So uh, for those of you who never used Android Studio, Android Studio is uh, uh, the ID provided by Google to develop Android apps. Okay? And uh, here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the project that I just uh, generated, which currently is in this folder, and it is in uh, Faust, it is in examples, it is uh, in smart keyboard. So you can see that all these things are actually available in the Faust distribution. Okay. So uh, in, later, I will just point you to some tutorials online where everything that I'm saying here uh, is, uh, is uh, just repeated. You know, I've, all, all that is documented and there are tutorials for it. Don't kill yourself, Sebastian. Uh, very good. So here, I just want to open the project that was generated. So Android Studio is loading it. Those uh, project files are pretty big, so you know sometimes it uh, might take a while. You know, because here it's just building, you know, like all the and indexing all the files. You know, so you have to wait um, a little bit. But once this is uh, done, all we have to do is to compile the app and then run it on the device. And uh, and so it's still indexing, so I have to wait uh, a little bit more. It's building symbols, and eventually, eventually, I will be able to run <coughs> this app. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So now I'm running the app. My phone is connected to my computer, so now I can choose to run the app on my Samsung Galaxy S5, which is connected to my computer, and I'll just say OK. So now it is compiling the app, okay? and once it will be compiled, uh, it will just launch it on the, launch it on the, on the device. Okay. So while this is happening, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the code of the, uh, that we have here, you know, which is just Faust code. So, uh, so I think what's really exciting about this whole thing you know, is that we can just use Faust to create a fully uh, working app, you know, like, which is completely standalone, and where the interface is really uh, very configurable. So uh, all these apps are based on this interface, which is called the Smart Keyboard um, Interface. So, the smart keyboard interface uh, is a very highly customizable interface uh, that you can turn into a keyboard like the one I showed you before, into drum pads, into uh, XY controllers, into many, many, many different things. You know, and, um, and all that always using um, the paradigm of uh, several keyboards um, in parallel. So the app is up. Uh, so it fails, so it's alright. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you want to install? Uh, yes, please uninstall the app. Yeah, so I think this is 
Almost done. There we go. So I now have the same app that the one I had on my iPad, right? Uh, it's a smaller screen, you know, but, uh, but uh, if I can, if I want to play it, you know, it works, and it's exactly the same as the one I had before. So this is completely cross-platform. This works on the iPad, this works on Android, and that's uh, that's uh, pretty nice. So what is uh, going on in here? So I'm declaring the smart keyboard interface, and here I'm specifying the different things that I want in the interface. So the first thing I'm saying is, I'm saying I want five keyboards. Okay, so the number of keyboards is five. So one, two, three, five. Yep. Uh, then uh, I want my keyboards to be monophonic. Okay. Keyboards could be polyphonic, meaning that if you put several fingers on each keyboard, each finger will actually generate a different sound. Uh, here, I don't want that. Here, I want the keyboards to be monophonic so that I can do things like that. Yeah, so, uh, so like here, I have a specific type of monophonic, you know, like where uh, start a note, but the note gets stolen, you know, and, and then it's going back to the previous note uh, if I still have my finger on the, on the keyboard. Uh, here I'm allowing uh, slides between different keyboards, which means that I can now do this. Okay. Uh, in mono mode one is the mode where uh, when you don't have polyphony on your keyboard, uh, you can do that basically. So it allows you to do voice stealing, but there are many different mono modes that you can use. There is one where uh, there is no voice stealing. There is one where voice stealing happens but only from left to right, or another one where it's only from right to left, and etc. So this is really very highly uh, configurable. And because um, you know, like typically in the world of synthesizers, monophony is uh, handled in many different ways. You know, and, and that's kind of what this parameter is. Uh, this parameter here allows you to uh, to do. Then we'll just say we want 13 keys for keyboard 0, 13 for 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay? And then um, I just configure the MIDI number, MIDI note number of the loudest key of the keyboard. So uh, the, the highest keyboard, which is keyboard 0, the loudest key is MIDI number 77, uh, which is an F5, I think. Uh, then 72, that's uh, C5, and etc. You know, so, so here I'm really configuring the, the shape of the, the interface, you know, like uh, for for what I want to, to do. And then this parameter here is very important, and is actually uh, is actually pretty cool and very important for touch screens. Uh, there are three uh, ways to configure this parameter. If you say zero. Keys are completely quantized, which means that uh, if you uh, slide your finger across the keyboard, then you will do C, C sharp, D, E flat, etc. You know, and you will not have continuous control of the pitch of the sound that is generated. If you set it to one, then you will have full continuous control. If you set it to two, that's the magic mode. And in the magic mode, uh, you have uh, continuous control, but your keys are always in tune. Okay, so that's one of the main challenges when you make that type of interface on a touch screen. Because um, depending on ding on where your finger is going to touch the key, okay, uh, if it's a little bit too far on the left, you know, maybe uh, you're going to be out of tune. You know, like, so basically, if you're in middle one, you're you're only going to be in tune if your finger is at the middle of the key. Okay. Mode 2 allows you to always be in tune, okay? So that if I do this, this is in tune, okay? But then I can still do slides, and I can do vibrato, okay? Uh, so it's kind of hard to implement in the background because all these things are happening and are tracking the position of your finger, you know, but if you don't do it, then if you want to play tonal music with that kind of interface, uh, you really need to be able to do that, otherwise the, the, the keyboard is going to be out of tune, right? Does that, does that make sense or...? Yeah. Yeah, very cool. So, uh, once the interface is declared, uh, then we need to bridge it to uh, the sound synthesis parts of our Faust uh, file, okay? So this is the graphical interface. And this is our synthesis um, algorithm. Okay. 
So in between here, what we're doing is that we're declaring parameters uh, that are connecting the interface to the synthesizer. Okay. So the first parameter that we have here is the freq parameter. That's the frequency parameter. The frequency parameter, uh, which is uh, used to control uh, the frequency of the circuit wave oscillator that we have here, okay, uh, gets automatically mapped to uh, the MIDI pitch number of the key that you're uh, that you're pressing, okay. So, uh, so it means that uh, if you press uh, this uh, key here on the touch screen, if it's an F5, then it will be converted to a frequency mapped to this parameter. Uh, then you have F here and F, so that's where things get a little bit complicated. Um, uh, we separated uh, the we separated continuous control of the pitch from. Um, uh, uh, quantized control of the pitch uh, so that it kind of corresponds more to uh, MIDI standards to some extent. Okay, so freak is the MIDI note number, so that's really like uh, the MIDI note number of the key that you're pressing on the touch screen. Okay, and then BEM is a parameter which corresponds to the pitch wheel uh, that you would have on a MIDI keyboard and which allows you to bend the pitch. You know, so in other words, to do this. Okay. So what we do is we always multiply F by BEM, so that's what we're doing here. So that's like the reference frequency multiplied by BEM, you know, and then we're bending the pitch, you know, and that's what we're using uh, to control the frequency of the Sabbath wave oscillator that we have here. Uh, I know I'm going very fast with all these things, you know, but, uh, but that's kind of not really the, the point of the workshop here. You know, like, uh, I just want to give you like a very big overview of all that you can do with uh, with this uh, system. This is not a fast workshop, so um, so that's what we're doing here. Um, uh, then uh, here we're just retrieving the gain. Okay, so gain here is assigned to uh, to MIDI velocity. So if we plug a MIDI keyboard uh, to uh, to this uh, iPad, we will be able to control this synthesizer as well, and uh, and uh, and the velocity of the key will be mapped to to gain automatically. Uh, Sustain uh, is pretty cool. So if you plug uh, a sustain pedal to your uh, to your uh, MIDI keyboard that you would plug to the iPad, you would be able to uh, uh, to add sustain. So what we're doing here with sustain, we have the S parameter which is here, and S gets multiplied, well, gets added to T. You know, so the gate parameter that we have here changes in function of uh, the gate parameter, which is node on or node off or uh, the sustain pedal, so that if you keep the sustain pedal, then the gate, so the, the trigger stays on no matter what uh, happens. Yep. And then finally, we have this uh, parameter here, which is Y, and Y corresponds to the Y position of your finger on any key on the keyboard. Okay. So, uh, so in other words, that's, the, that's just the, posi the normalized position of my finger on any key on the keyboard. So, uh, so if I'm here, it's zero, zero point five, one. Okay, uh, and so here I'm using Y to control the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter. So if I have Y that I'm returning here, multiplying by four thousand, so that the, the the maximum frequency will be four thousand and fifty hertz. Okay, and I'm adding fifty hertz so that the lowest frequency will be fifty hertz. Okay, so uh, so and that's what we get here. So. That's the cutoff frequency of my low pass filter. Uh, and then here we have the synthesis line, which I already talked about, you know, and, uh, which uh, then, you know, just make this a uh, nice, uh, very simple, uh, very simple instrument. So I know I'm going very quick with all these things, you know, but once again, the, the whole point, you know, is to uh, just uh, give you an overview of what you can do with, uh, with this system. So, uh, so at the end, with only 55 lines of code, we have an app which is pretty playable, you know, and uh, that could be potentially used in uh, some kind of musical, musical context. One thing I haven't talked about here yet are uh, the smooth. So the smooth that we have here or that we have here are smoothing functions. Uh, you know, they're just moving the, 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 the different values that we're getting from here, for example. So uh, the values that we have for Y are not uh, coming at audio rates. Uh, they are 
coming at control rate or actually at the touch screen rate. Uh, and uh, if we don't smooth them, uh, we're probably going to get clicks uh, in the sound of the low pass return. So, uh, so that's why we have a smooth uh, ear. And uh, the envelope generator, as I said earlier, is implemented using uh, some kind of smoothing, uh, smoothing uh, function. Okay. So that's one thing that you could do. Uh, that's uh, just a very simple little uh, instrument. Now I'm going to show you another example of something that is completely different and that literally has nothing to do with an actual musical instrument. And it's more like a sound toy. So, uh, so, uh, so actually, let's uh, look at uh, this. So once again, all these codes that you have here are part of the fast distributions. They are in the example directory. So, uh, so if you want to uh, compile them no. and run them on your mobile phone, it will be. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah. Um, the, the laptop. I'm today. Uh, many uh, laptop have uh, touch screen. Yes. So uh, this uh, run. Uh, That's a very good laptop. question, actually. Uh, well. The answer is no, whatever your question was going to be. <laughs> also me. <laughs> now basically, uh, so this interface is currently only available on Android and iOS. Uh, there is no Faust architecture that supports this interface uh, yet. And I guess we should probably think about that. Um, maybe that could be a nice contribution, Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah no that's uh, I mean you know like the, the big problem with all these things is that um, um, so on Android the interface is written in Java on iOS it's written in Objective C um, and uh, and if we want to make it work on your laptop with uh, you know like uh, Faust uh, Qt interface or whatever it would have to be written in C plus plus using Qt or whatever, you know. So it means that every time we want to support something for all these things, we have to rewrite everything from scratch, uh, which kind of takes uh, time, you know. And, uh, and so, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, it's always the same uh, question of manpower. But, uh, but so, yeah, no, unfortunately, we, we don't have that for, for laptops yet. Uh, but um, any other question or? No, I'm just like, uh, but. And so you just talked about a toy, I don't understand the, the word. The what? You are going to show us something, and uh, I don't understand the word. You, you, you speak about the toy. Yeah, so the next, uh, yeah, the thing that I'm going to show now is a sound toy. <laughs> um, and, uh, meaning that it's not really, uh, uh, well, I just called it's it's more a sound toy than a musical instrument, and what it does yeah. is just uh, a sound, a sound toy. yeah, a sound toy, and what it does is just uh, this, yeah. So this nice funny little app, you know, where uh, you can use the accelerometer to uh, control some parameters. Uh, you can use the touch screen to control other parameters. Yeah. You know, and do uh, all these things you don't know. And here the interface is very different than the one we had before because it's just a blank screen. <laughs> uh, but so uh, so that's one of the other examples that you have in the Faust distribution to uh, well to use with the Faust Smart uh, Keyboard uh, Faust Smart Keyboard System. You know, uh, and so here is the, the code of it. You know, I'm just going to go through it uh, with you a little bit to see how this uh, works. Okay. So first. In terms of sound processing, same story as before, there is not much going on here. It's very, very, very simple. Um, what we have is we have an impulse train. Okay? So the impulse train just creates clicks at every samples at a specific frequency, right? So, so it's just like a metronome, right? It's like tack, 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 tack. Okay? We can control the frequency of the impulse train using the imp uh, freak uh, parameter that we have here. Okay, and then the impulse train is connected to a resonant low pass filter. The resonant low pass filter that we're using here is used to give a pitch to the pulses that were generated. So, uh, if we go back to the app. So we hear the clicks, so the ta 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 that's the impulse frame, yeah. that's the cutoff 
That's the cutoff frequency of the low-pass filter. Okay. Um, and then we have an echo. And the echo is just here so that we can create some density in the sound you know, and make it sound a little bit louder. And then finally, we have a distortion plugin that is used here just to make things sound louder. So, here we're doing this dirty hack where we're basically using uh, a guitar distortion. Uh, so that's really a guitar distortion plugin that we're using here to just uh, amplify the sound that is generated uh, by distorting it as well, you know, put up without creating uh, clipping and, you know, like the, the whole point about making those little instruments is that the speakers on your smartphone are very shitty by definition, you know, like so, uh, so you should not be worried about uh, making dirty things like that, you know, like where you just um, make it much, much, much louder, you know, and make it sound bad, you know, but, but bad is good sometimes, you know, and, um, and that's kind of what we're uh, doing here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we just split the signal into two different signals so that we have sound going to the left speaker and sound going to the right speaker. So, uh, in terms of uh, DSP algorithm, everything is relatively simple here, right? Once again, impulse strain, resolute low pass filter, echo, and uh, cubic uh, distortion. <coughs> By the way, um, I'm not really sure why I did this like that because there is actually an echo function in the fast library, but, uh, but that's how you would implement a very basic echo in uh, Faust. Uh, very, very basic in that case, you know. So, uh, so we just have a DLN line uh, with a feedback coefficient, and then uh, we're creating uh, a loop uh, using the tilde operator that we have here, you know. Like once again, I, I don't want to talk too much about Faust here because that's not really the, the point of this, uh, of this uh, workshop. Cool. So then in terms of the smart keyboard interface that we have, things are relatively straightforward as well. We only have one keyboard, okay? Uh, you know, if we uh, look at the interface once again, we only have uh, one keyboard with one key, okay? And um, we have one keyboard uh, with one key, um, and then we're doing this thing where we're saying the maximum keyboard polyphony is just zero. What does this mean? Because I don't know if you remember earlier, but when we used this parameter earlier for the other app, it was one for monophony. And if it's more than one, then it's polyphony, and it's the maximum number of voices of polyphony that you're going to have uh, on your keyboard. When it's zero, what we say is that we want it to be monophonic, but not only we want it to be monophonic, we actually want it to start when we open the app. Which is why here, when I start the app, I already get sound, you know, like even though I'm not touching the, the touch screen, you know. And, um, and that's very important in some cases, you know, because if you want to make a sound toy like the one I have here, well, in that case, you actually want to get sound right from the beginning, you know, and uh, you don't want to get sound whenever you're touching the, the screen because there is no concept of key. Um, then we say that we don't want the whole thing to, to be a piano keyboard, which means that in that case, if you press the key, the color of the key won't change. You know, and, uh, and so that's why we have this parameter uh, here. Uh, finally, we ask the system to count the fingers that are touching the touch screen, so that you can track the position of the different fingers and assign different parameters to each finger. Uh, so, uh, so as a matter of fact, here, what is happening is that here I'm controlling the speed at which clicks are being generated, faster, slower, then I'm controlling the pitch of the clicks, and then if I add another finger, then I can control the gain of the whole thing. Okay. So, uh, so here I can really create those complex gestures where I can use multiple fingers on the touch screen and assign different parameters to, uh, to, uh, to each finger. Okay. So how does this work then in terms of mapping uh, if we go down uh, below? So um, what we have is, see that now we have X and Y parameters, but unlike in the previous examples, X and Y parameters are now numbered. And they are numbered in function of the fingers that you have on the screen. 
So x0 corresponds to the normalized position, uh, the normalized x position of the first finger that is touching the screen. Same for y0. Then y1 is the normalized position of the second finger touching the screen. Okay? And you can use as many fingers as you want, you're only limited by uh, the maximum number of fingers that can be placed on the, on the touch uh, screen. Okay? Um, so that's for uh, those parameters here. Then we have accelerometers as well, right? So we're using the accelerometers uh, to control different parameters here. So uh, just uh, to show you once again. So uh, here I'm controlling the feedback of the echo. Yeah. And here I'm controlling the duration of the echo. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing with those uh, different parameters that I have here. So, um, so uh, here I'm controlling actually the Q of the filter using the accelerometer. The way this mapping works is that the first parameter you have here is the accelerometer axis. Zero, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Zero stands for X, one is for Y, two is for Z, right? So uh, X, Y, Z. Okay. Um, and those are mappings, and I'm not really talking about them here, you know, they just allow you to uh, describe the behavior of the accelerometer. If you're interested in those things, it's also documented in the, in the Faust uh, distribution. Um, so that's for the Q, that's the DLA duration, M, that's the feedback of the echo. Okay, so uh, DLA of the echo, feedback of the echo, and all these things are going through smoothing functions so that whenever I change parameters, uh, I don't get uh, clicks. Okay. Then I just do some mapping here, I'm retrieving x, so because x is normalized, it has a value between 0 and 1, and here I'm just converting it into uh, a frequency that I can use with my uh, impulse train generator. So, uh, so I'm, just, uh, I'm just saying I want the minimum frequency to be 2 Hz, and then I'm adding uh, x0 multiplied by 20 to 2 Hz, so it means that the range uh, of my impulse train frequency is going to be between 2 Hz and 22 Hz, right? Uh, and uh, same thing for uh, the resonant frequency of the little resonant low pass filter. 300 hertz is going to be the minimum frequency, and the maximum frequency is going to be 3,000 plus 300, which is uh, 3,300. Okay. And, um, and so the reason why I have to do all these things, you know, is because once again, those values that I'm getting here are normalized values. You know, they are standard parameters. So, uh, so what I'm getting here is a number between zero and one, which is why I have to do all the mapping at this <coughs> level, uh, at this level in here. Any, uh, any questions so far? I'm, I know I'm kind of bombing you guys with all these information, so you don't put up, but it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's, uh, we don't have that much time left, you know, and I just kind of want to give a very broad overview of what can be done with this uh, tool, but, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, let's keep doing them. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's look at another example. So, uh, uh, what you can do with Fast and Smart Keyboard uh, is that you can have a file to specify the sound synthesizer, which is what we have here. You can have another file to specify the audio effect, which will be connected to a potentially polyphonic sound synthesizer. Okay? So, uh, I don't know if you know this app, which is not open source, uh, it's called GeoShred. Uh, it's made by uh, Jordan Rudis and friends, uh, and it's running a guitar physical model in the background, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jordan Rudis uses it in his dream theater concerts very often, you know, on stage, you know, and, um, and, uh, and so, uh, so it kind of sounds like this, you know, and I'm very bad at playing it, but, uh, well, right now it doesn't sound like anything. Uh, why is it? Maybe the audio is stuck, but I'm gonna key out everything. Usually it tends to solve problems on iOS. Key out, key out, key out, key out, key out, key out. Okay, so back. Okay, so maybe now it's gonna work. And it's loading. There we go. 
So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, Jordan Wordis's app. Uh, that you can get for, I think, fourteen dollars on the App Store. Uh, well, in the fastest distribution, you have the open source version of it, <laughs> uh, which is implemented using the our system. It doesn't really sound exactly the same as what it is, you know, but it kind of works the same way. So uh, let me just show it to you. You know, like so, we have our usual keyboard, which kind of looks like the one we had before for the the trumpet. Okay. Um, but you know, it's a. Uh, Okay. So uh, in that case, what we do is that we have a very, 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 very simple uh, string physical model, uh, which is going through, I think, um, a distortion, obviously. I mean, it does sound like a distortion. And then uh, to some uh, kind of reverb. I guess I could probably do that too, uh, which might sound even better. All right. No. Uh, no. 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 Okay. What are we done? Okay. Well, maybe not. Uh, there are a lot of cables here. That's funny. I thought it would. That would work. There we go. I mean, those speakers are probably good enough. So let's investigate the code of this things a little bit, you know, and see how uh, we can implement that kind of stuff here. So. Uh, as far as the audio effect is concerned, uh, things are relatively simple because that's uh, the code of the audio effect. It's just uh, distortion. Uh, and we have this here you know, because uh, we want it to be in stereo, so we have two distortions running in parallel for the two output channels of the uh, string physical model, which is then going through zero ref, zero ref those of you who are using uh, Reverbs and Linux probably know about Zeta Rev, you know, so that's the fast version of Z Zeta Rev, uh, which, is, uh, which was implemented by um, Fonts Adrianson, uh, who's here today. Um, so it's very simple, you know, so we have one file for the effect uh, chain, and then we have one file for uh, the sort of physical model, um, which is not really a physical model, but, uh, but we kind of try to call it like that uh, here. Uh, how does it work? It's pretty straightforward. Well, we have a string, then we have a noise burst. So, uh, so we just send a noise burst in the string. The string is essentially some sort of carpus wrong here. And then <coughs> we have a low-pass filter, uh, which we're using here. Uh, to sort of uh, change the frequency content of the noise burst uh, depending on the, the the frequency of the of the screen, you know, so that when you when you tap on a large string, uh, you get more low frequency than if you were tapping on a higher string, which kind of naturally happens when you play guitar because uh, large strings on a guitar are thicker than uh, higher strings, and because they are thicker. Um, well, there is more contact between your finger and so the impedance is a little bit different, you know, so you get more low uh, frequency content, which is why we have this low pass filter in, uh, in here. Um, so how is the string implemented? Well, I'm not going to go into details, you know, because that's uh, beyond the scope of this workshop, but, uh, but this is just uh, like some kind of advanced Carpus Strong algorithm, you know, like, so, uh, so we have a loop, and uh, we have a fractional delay for order to change the length of the string. And then we have a bridge filter here uh, to implement the reflection waves that are uh, inside, the, inside the, the string. I'm not going to go into details because, once again, that's uh, kind of beyond the scope of the workshop. Then, as far as the interface is concerned, uh, it's very similar to the one that we had earlier, you know, but we have six, uh, six keyboards. Uh, the maximum keyboard polyphony in that case is one, you know, and then uh, we have uh, 13 keys for each keyboard. You know, here we're configuring our keys, you know, and of course this is monophonic, and that's important because what we're trying to recreate here are uh, key, uh, our, um, guitar strings, you know, and, uh, and guitar strings are not polyphonic, they are monophonic, right? So you can strum. 
Okay? Uh, but uh, then if you press... Uh, which is the same thing that what you would get on a guitar, right? I mean, uh, you always go back up. So, so, uh, so that's kind of the idea. One thing I haven't really showed you here is how to compile this so that we're using the effect uh, file. Uh, this is very simple as well. Uh, indeed, we can uh, just reuse the uh, uh, script that we were using earlier. So here, I'm just going to say that I want to compile electricguitar.dsv, um, but I want to do what I want to do as well is to specify the effect file. What I'm going to do this is just by specifying effects, and effect um, here is an associated effect, and it's electric guitar effects. So you can see that I can specify uh, the effect file independently from the synthesizer file, uh, which is very, very important, uh, because the thing is, those devices have uh, a very limited uh, CPU power. Uh, every time you add a new voice of polyphony, uh, you add more computation, right? Uh, in general, uh, on an actual electric guitar, uh, you have only one distortion for the entire guitar. You don't have uh, a distortion for each string of the guitar, right? Uh, so to save computation here, what we're doing is that we're uh, uh, specifying the effect shape in a separate file uh, from the synthesizer file. You know, and then you just press run, you know, it generates the project, then you can open it in Android Studio, mod it on your device, and it's really uh, as simple as, uh, as that. Um, any questions about this, or do you kind of start to get it, or that does it sort of make sense, or... And then uh, once again, you know, I'm just uh, trying to give you an overview of this tool, you know, and then if you want to use it later at home, you know, or, or uh, then uh, you can potentially try to uh, to do this. But, uh, so uh, um, if you're interested in those things, you know, I want to learn more about it. Uh, if you go on my website, uh, which is here, uh, there, so it's a. Uh, karma.stanford.edu slash tilde r uh, There's a bunch of Faust tutorials. Uh, there aren't many of them. Like, uh, just, uh, like each of these things are uh, independent tutorials. Uh, but uh, if we zoom in, uh, there are tutorials on making Faust-based uh, smartphone musical instruments. So if you follow this link, uh, you have uh, hours of things to do to make that types of instruments on your uh, cell phone for iOS or for Android, and all the required uh, and needed tools that you need to install to make this possible, basically. So, uh, so, uh, so that's kind of the that's kind of the kind of the idea. Uh, then, uh, just to conclude, uh, if you go in the Faust uh, distribution, you know Faust is available on GitHub. Uh, if you go in the examples folder, which is where we were, in the examples folder you have um, smart keyboard. Okay, so just click on smart keyboard. In Smart Keyboard, you have all the examples that we uh, studied in this workshop. You know, so each of these codes can be potentially independent apps that you can have for Android or for, uh, for iOS. Um, one that I just added with Albert the other day is kind of funny. It's a, it's a weird vocal synthesizer. So, uh, so this one, uh, it's like... Uh, Like if there's a tenor trapped in your phone and you're shaking his head. So, uh, so kind of recommend you to try that one. The, the code is all there. You know, so it's, it's pretty funny to play you know, like, you know, with other people at restaurants like we did uh, last <laughs> night. So, uh, um, anyway, I, honestly, I think that's probably pretty much it for, for, for this workshop. Do you guys have any questions? I'm sure. I'm sure, well, I'm sorry this was a little bit confusing, you know, but, uh, but um, uh, primarily our goal was to have you make things 
uh, with the 3D printers, but unfortunately we don't have them in New York, so, uh, so, uh, so we had to prefer all these things kind of last minute, you know, and hopefully uh, you're in something, you know, now you will want to use Faust or our Open Sky library and try to make apps uh, using the Faust program language, but do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, I would like um, to ask, um, you saw this uh, um, strong uh, feedback and it was implemented function delay filter it was with, with four point interpolation, right? It was, it was a fourth order, yeah. Well, the interpolation was here for the, the, the DLM line, you know? Yes. It was in Lagrange or Sync? Uh, uh, it's Lagrange. Yeah, okay. Does the file support also other filtering? Process? Yeah, uh, there is a Lagrange, all pass. Yeah, goes also higher orders? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, you uh, actually you can go as high as you want. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, because uh, so that. Uh, that function is just a syntactic sugar for a more generic function where you can actually specify the order by hand, basically. So, uh, so okay. uh, yeah. And I have this question in general. What, what, uh, the four point, why is considered the golden? Sort of, yeah. I mean, uh, you can do more, but if you do more, it's, it's computationally uh, more. Yeah, it's more computation, and uh, it doesn't really change much at the end. Like that's uh, mm. I don't know. Like to me, it's it always with four, it always kind of sounded tuned. So uh, I never like I never faced any problem with that. You know, and uh, and, uh, and it doesn't change the, the frequency content of your carpet strong too much as well. Anymore. So yeah, four four is kind of the the standard standard yeah, yeah. one. So and, uh, yeah, I mean you can use two, but two two is kind of dangerous though. Like uh, I feel like with two is like you know with higher uh, pitches your your it's not all pass, it's right? Yeah, it's filters the high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and yeah, and actually it also filters uh, a little bit the higher frequencies too. So yeah. Yeah. No, no I mean Faust is really good for physical modeling. I mean Faust is not good for everything, but uh, if, what, if there is one thing that Faust does very well, it's filters and physical modeling. I mean uh, those two things are the, are very good. You know, just because G. D. Smith implemented so many functions uh, that are available, you know, and freely available in the in the Faust source code, you know, like for filters or for you know, like all these DLM you know, lines or whatever, you know, that, uh, it's uh, it's actually very um, it's, it's just very nice for that. So, okay. Any other question or? Nice. Well, John, what do you think? I think it's time for a beer. Yes, uh, it's a sort of 3D printing with uh, <laughs> yes. you know, it builds up the glass. Oh, hey. and, <laughs> so, well, thank you guys for coming, and once again, sorry for not having printers, you know, but, uh, but uh, that was uh, completely uh, beyond our control. So, uh, but thank you.